Um, if I could just get you each to introduce yourselves so that whoever's potentially mixing this at the other end can put your name to your voice in the audio, if that's all right. So Maria, do you want to go first? And do you want me to record it as well on mine? Is that? Uh, yeah, if you want to start recording on your iPhone, that would be great. And Ellie, um, if you don't mind recording on your iPhone as well, it might get some of the sound from the laptop, but it will give us a second option in terms of audio. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll do that. Thank you. Starting, I have started it, so. Excellent. Um, and would you mind just introducing yourself on Zoom so that we can? Yep, so I'm Dr. Maria Ray and I'm a senior lecturer in politics and policy at Deakin University. And Ellie? And I, uh, sorry, and I'm Ellie Skogelberg. I'm a professor at the Department of Media and Communication at the University of Oslo, Norway, and I'm into political communication in many ways. Excellent. And uh, I'm Ebony Bennett hosting this uh, webinar this evening. Um, so as I've discussed with both of you, uh, we'll go into, I'll do a bit of housekeeping at the top, um, you know, uh, to make things run smoothly, what we're planning to talk about. I'll intro introduce you both. We have a little video to play um, about Nordic Talks, uh, a brand video, and then we'll just go into the discussion. We'll have about half an hour um, of discussion with just the three of us covering the kind of topics that we talked about. Um, and then we'll have probably about 20 to 25 minutes with Q&A with the audience. And so if the question is directed to you, I'll kind of say your name so you know that I'm, I'm addressing the question to you and there's no confusion. Does that all make sense to everyone? Makes Very sense to me. <laughs> Excellent. So we've nearly cracked a thousand people registered. So uh, I'm not sure how many will join us live this evening, but it's a pretty good turnout, which is really exciting. So yeah, thank you both for your time. Oh, it'd be great. I'm really looking forward to what Ellie has to say. I've been reading about Scandinavian media for the past couple of years, as has Ebony. So it's <laughs> interesting to see what Ellie agrees with or disagrees with. <laughs> and I'm uh, just excited to be here. I know less about Australia than I do about the Nordic countries. So let's, <laughs> let's hope that uh, that works out. Should be a good match then. And um, Sumitri, if you can hear me on there. Um, I think um, Jake put up the report that we did today. The media release and the report should be up on the website if we refer to that, um, if you want to post it in the chat. Thank you so much. Dimitri, uh, my colleague is here. She'll be monitoring um, the chat. And we've got another colleague, Charlie, who will be live tweeting it as well. So um, yeah, this will all get recorded. We've got about five minutes if you need to go and grab like a glass of water or go to the toilet or anything before we okay, kick off. I've got a glass of water okay. and yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I'll, Ellie, also, uh, I'll also just uh, see if I can get this working. Something just happened. So uh, let's see. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> see you in five minutes. That, yeah, uh, we've got yeah. five minutes until we go live. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See you then. Just stop my camera. No I'm worries. Out. Um, so Maria, uh, yeah, we got um, a little write up in Cracky this morning for the paper and oh, I think Cracky was planning to come along and listen tonight. So yeah, I hope it'll get, oh. hope it'll get a little run for the report. Oh, that'd be terrific. Yeah. yeah. I always love doing these because um, you get so much engagement with people, um, which, you know, my classrooms are so small. It's nice to actually um, get get what oh, no, we've I'm done good. out Thank there. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's been really good for that, actually. Like, we get a really decent turnout for it most, most times. And, yeah, I'm just always amazed. People just love to be involved in kind of public, like, they're just endlessly curious about all kinds of public policy. It doesn't even matter if they've never heard about it before. So, yeah. And we've got do, a couple more of these Nordic ones. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's mostly people in the public service? who attend? Yeah, there'd be a big chunk, I think. But um, also, I think it's just a bunch of Australia Institute supporters from around the place. And they're just kind of just really interested in politics and policy, generally speaking. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah.
<clears throat> so where did you visit when you were out in Australia, Ellie? So where did I? Where did you visit in Australia when you were here? I uh, I was mostly in Canberra actually. Uh, oh yeah. Last, uh, with uh, with the um, News and Media Institute and uh, Cam and the at uh, the UC. Yep. And, um, and then I was at the the uh, Anska conference in, conference in Wollongong and also visited some um friends and colleagues around melbourne among them christy as you know maria <laughs> so, and, andrew said we just missed each other that yeah i think so <laughs> so that was um that was uh, really fun and we didn't we didn't actually speak about this because they came from different channels yeah i think it was the embassy who, who actually was asked about somebody and um I had also met with the ambassador who I know from my studies. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so we have had, we, there was a connection there. She has just started her term in uh, Australia. So that was also, I think everything was very much of a co coincidence. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, hopefully we'll get to meet in person one day. I'll have to find an excuse to come to Norway. <laughs> yeah, you should. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's it's a bit difficult in these climate crisis days to uh, justify any travels, I feel. I but uh, this one was the one that should have been in the one that I had in the autumn was the one that I should have had in the spring or my spring. That is your autumn in 2020. Oh, before the pandemic yeah. ruined everything. <laughs> During the pandemic, actually, uh, as and of course, it was cancelled and uh, I couldn't go. Yeah. yeah. Well, I am actually visiting Norway, hopefully in July of this year. I'm coming to do the Kungsleden, the Kingsway in Sweden as a hike. And then I'm going to come across, hopefully, to the Lofoten Islands, I'm hoping. <laughs> oh. To the which island? Uh, I'm probably not saying it right. The Lofoten Islands? Oh, yeah. Lofoten. Yeah. Lofoten. Okay. I'll remember. Yeah, it's, to yeah. that I thought you said well, it's it's the area, it's lots of islands. It's it's beautiful. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, I'm not uh, July is the month when everybody is on holiday. Uh -huh. But uh, and I haven't decided what I'm going to do this year, but perhaps I'll be in the vicinity. <laughs> I have some family around there. So uh, Keep I'll touch. send you an email before I come over because I yeah. think I'll be flying back out of Oslo. So, um, yeah, I might end up closer to you than than planned. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, absolutely. All right. So. Well, we've got one minute to go. Um, so, yeah, any other questions before we get started? And no, Dimitri, everything. I think I've made you co-host and everything. You're all good. Great. All right. And this and the sound is working without my AirPods. I'm sorry about that. No, no, 100%. We can hear you. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, I'll send you a link to the recording. We'll just put it up on our YouTube page so mm -hmm. that you can, you know, do whatever you like with it and promote it through your own networks. And um, and in a few months, we'll make it into a podcast for our podcast. And I'll let you know when that goes up um, as well. But for now, we'll just do this and then put it up on YouTube um, as a video afterwards for anyone who couldn't come live. Wonderful. All right. Well, I'm going to get us started. So when I count backwards from three, essentially we'll all be live on camera and um, everyone can see everything you do, like being on television. So just a warning, even if we're not talking to you or you're not talking, people will still be able to see you. All right. Here we go in three, two, one. G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to the second episode of our Nordic Talks series of webinars. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, of this land on which I live and work, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to Elders past and present, and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And of course, we have a big debate headed towards us in Australia about the voice to parliament and a referendum later in this year. 
And I encourage everyone to go and read up on the voice and the referendum and what you can do to help out on that. Just a few tips before we begin today to help things run smoothly. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar in the second half. We've got a Q&A box in Zoom where you can ask questions of our panelists. You should be able to upvote questions um, from other people and make comments in, the, in it as well. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we will boot you out. And lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and it will be posted up on our YouTube channel. That's australiainstitute.tv. And there is a chance that down the track, it will become a Nordic Talks podcast. For those of you who don't know, the Australia Institute is one of Australia's most influential think tanks. We're based here in Canberra. And this is the second in a special Nordic Talks series of webinars. Um, the five episode series is presented by the Australia Institute's Nordic Policy Centre and supported by the Nordic Council of Ministers. And I encourage you all to check out the Nordic Talks podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. Each episode, we're going to be tackling a pressing policy issue that is shared by both Australia and the Nordic nations and explore some of the Nordic policies and exciting possibilities they provide for Australia to overcome some of our seemingly intractable problems. Um, so before we begin, I've got a short video to play here, assuming that I can actually play this. I always find it difficult to play videos. Um, so this is just a little bit of the Nordic Talks. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, so uh, now I'd like to introduce today's topic, the value of a free press, uh, supporting public interest journalism in Norway and Australia. Norway is number one on the World Press Freedom Index, while Australia in recent years, well, last year, dropped 14 places in 2022. And that's due in part to the highly concentrated media landscape that we have. So what lessons can Australia learn from Norway's targeted press support subsidies, its support for public broadcasting and public interest journalism? And what lessons can Norway learn from Australia's world leading news media bargaining code about regulating big tech platforms such as Google and Facebook? As we enter an age of mass disinformation, the role of public interest journalism is really more crucial than ever for a strong and informed democracy. So I'm delighted to introduce our two panelists today, Professor Eli Skugaba and Dr. Maria Ray. Uh, professor Eli Skugaba is a professor at the Department of Media and Communication and co-director of POLCOM, the Centre for the Study of Political Communication at the University of Oslo. And with her permission, I hope I haven't butchered her surname, I'm going to call her Ellie for the rest of the webinar. And Dr. Maria Ray is a senior lecturer in politics and policy at Deakin University and a former newspaper journalist. She teaches and researches political communication and the media. Uh, and her interests include media and politics, political communication, the role of media in transitional justice and the politics of human rights. Uh, welcome, Maria and Ellie. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Ellie, I want to begin uh, with you. For many people in Australia to conceive of the idea of some of the inspiration um, uh, that the Australia Institute has taken for its latest report that we've got up on our website about media policy and how to encourage media diversity, um, looking at Norway's example of permanent public subsidies to newspapers 
as a means of encouraging media diversity and competition, um, it's, it's hard for Australians to imagine. Uh, it, we kind of think of it as being contrary to press freedom in some ways. Uh, can you tell me uh, how it is that the press support subsidies work and why they were first brought into being in the first place? Yeah, I can try and make a short history and uh, <laughs> an outline uh, of that. The press subsidies dates back to, uh, to the 60s. Uh, and the situation at that time was that Nor Norway had many newspapers at that time too. And it was very common that there were more new newspapers issued or in one uh, locality. So that if you lived in a small town, it, it was quite common that you could choose between one, two, three, four newspapers, and they would normally be alleged, not, not necessarily owned, but alleged to different parties. And this uh, model started to actually fall apart. And, uh, and the, there was a big worry that uh, there would be a loss of diversity because some parties' voices wouldn't be heard when uh, when one newspaper monopolized the smaller market. So this, this press subsidy was actually a compromise formed in parliament uh, for a, it's actually a quite small direct subsidy to struggling newspapers. It started as being only available for the so-called number two one, uh, number two, the ones who weren't uh, dominating in local competition. Uh, but since the subsidies did not work to stop all monopolization in local areas, it's developed over time in two ways. One thing is that the party press has actually uh, disappeared, not because it has been uh, Put down, but because the, the the newspaper market did not support that model, and professional journalism developed a an independence out of the the out of the party. What do you say? The party scene, the party market. So, so um, the original justification for the system disappeared, and it has been replaced by a justification that we need diversity whatsoever, and we need diversity in the newspaper market. So today you, there is, there, you can get the subsidy both if you struggle in competition, but also if, if it's a local newspaper that has a, uh, that, that is small in a local market. So it's about 200 newspapers now that get it, but not, not, not that get the subsidy, but in the market altogether. It's, it has never been a subsidy that has been uncontroversial. Uncontro it's always been controversial. It's, uh, it's decided on in parliament and it also is uh, very often used in, what should, what should I say, trade-offs. Well, okay, you get some more sub press subsidies if, if we get the road. That's uh, something that uh, quite often happen, but it's, it's, it's been kept. Um, so when it comes if I can just summarise, uh, you used to have a, quite a partisan newspaper business and originally the mm. subsidies were to help prop that up. But mm. as journalism professionalised, the subsidies remained in place to ensure media diversity, but in a different way for a more professional mm. independent press and to make sure that even small places have still have access to news. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely okay. correct. And um, just uh, to follow up on that a little bit, where do things stand now in terms of, um, I guess, support for them, given that Norway probably is still experiencing some of those issues of market value with the business model of journalism being really difficult in a, in a digital age? You're absolutely, uh, absolutely right about now the, the, the press subsidies are there and the direct subsidies are are a small part of all media subsidies, as they are called now. We also have a have a, um, uh, a VAT exemption and things like that. All these things are debated here too, and of course, we, uh, of course, Norwegian media, as media everywhere, 
is uh, leaking a lot of advertising income to the big to yeah to the big tech giants. It's been a long term discussion, um, and uh, yeah, there are lots of things going on. As I said, as I said when we talked earlier, it's Norway is not the paradise. No, <laughs> neither are the other uh, countries, but. But it's it's kept for the time being. I don't see that it will that the subs, the direct subsidies will lose out. But the VAT exemption is now under debate, so uh -huh. we will see. Um, and that's a much bigger subsidy. Mm -hmm. mm, all right, um, Maria. If I can come to you next, because you co-authored the report that the Nordic Policy Centre has just put out uh, today, and kind of based on a chapter from the Nordic Edge, the book published a, a, a year or two ago. Uh, what are some of the reasons that it's so important to look at the way other countries such as Norway that, you know, even though it's not a paradise, as Ellie says, <laughs> is number one in the Press Freedom Index, considering Australia's ultra-concentrated market, um, what are some of the things that you think it's important for Australia to be considering as we review media policy? Um, thanks, Ebony. And I was um, interested to hear from Ellie that it has been a controversial policy. Um, as you said, we have had an ultra concentrated media landscape here in Australia. Reporters Without Borders has actually called us an oligarchy. So historically, we had those three families, the Packers, the Murdochs and the Fairfaxes dominate. And they there's really been no political appetite or will to break up that domination. So um, it's really important for us to look at different media policies that have worked overseas, perhaps even with controversy, to see how we can create more diversity. Because the interventions that we have had um, under former Prime Minister Paul Keating, we had the cross-media ownership laws where you could be queens of the screen or princes of print. That only served to actually increase concentration. And it's one of the main reasons that we have slipped down uh, the um, Press Freedom Index is because of uh, the lack of uh, diversity, particularly in our newspaper market. Um, but there is, I think, now an appetite to, uh, especially since COVID, where we have seen so many newspaper organisations close, especially in local regional areas where um, communities are facing a news desert. Um, there has been more uh, consideration of what we can do to increase diversity, even starting with coalition government, who provided some funding support for small organisations. Uh, and now we have the new government um, uh, uh, announcing reviews into the sustainability of the ABC funding and also how to better support, long give long-term support to community and regional organisations. So it makes sense to look at other countries and what they're doing um, for sort of a best model approach. Mm. Um, Ellie, coming back to you uh, and, and thinking about how these subsidies work, and I know, you know you've said there's some other bigger ones, but um, I think people would be interested in kind of how they've evolved over time. So you've said in the past they were offered to kind of the second biggest newspaper uh, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in an area, but is there any other criteria attached to that? Like, do they have to report news? And, and are they subsidies for... Um, news reporters or for the production of news. Can you tell us a little bit how the press support, now media support, um, works? Um, it works yeah, It works fairly the way you, you say. Uh, we have a media authority who uh, administrates the, the uh, direct press support. And for a newspaper to be eligible for press subsidies it has to be have has to have been up and running for a year uh, minimum and it has to have news that's quite often uh, debated so uh it has to ha have some public public news and this is where where me, uh, press freedom and uh, intervention actually uh, but there are some quite clear criteria uh, when you said the second largest, what I meant is we, we call it the number two papers. It means that if there is competition in a local area, uh, and that's it's very few places left, it's you might be eligible, and if you if you are not the dominant one, that's uh, mm. that's the number two. It's not the number two, but everyone, every every newspaper that is 
uh, is not dominating. But also, as I said, uh, small local newspapers are eligible if they if they fulfill these these other criteria and obviously have uh, you also have to have a minimum subscriber market. Um, so I think. Uh, the reason why they have survived a lot of uh, debate over time is that the, um, there are enough interest in diversity in the political uh, system. We, we, unlike, we have a little bit of a different political system there, uh, than Australia, which means we have many parties in parliament. Uh, so, uh, so there is always a trade-off between different in interests. So, so as long as you can muster a majority for keeping, maintaining uh, press subsidies, they they are in place. And that has been the case now for over, yeah, for how long is it? More than 50 years. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> uh, and that still seem to uh, be going on. And I think the legitimation of diversity as a media political objective. And that objective has been stable for a very, very long time, even though the means, the subsidies, the ways we organize the media market, we also had laws, for instance, against media concentration once upon a time, they have been abolished, and we do have concentration, but not to the same degree as Australia, much, it's it's lower. Um, but uh, these objectives of diversity and also freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and I also think the uh, uh, the independent uh, press council, which which uh, secures press ethics and uh, works as a complaints. Uh, organ, could we say that, um, mm. that's independent of the state. I think all these things work together. So when you discuss one of these bits and pieces of, uh, of state support, there are also other pieces that fit in to create the independence that uh, is, of course, crucial. Yeah. And which is also, I think, crucial to the fact that we actually end up on top on the press freedom uh, list for this year. Because yeah, that was going to be my <laughs> next question is about mm. um, being on the top of the press freedom uh, index because you have some different infrastructure in place in Norway to Australia. We don't have freedom of speech or expression or freedom of the press enshrined in our constitution, for example. Um, what are some of the ways or some of the reasons why Norway despite not being a paradise, as you've said, <laughs> remains at the top of the press freedom index. How institutionally is freedom of the press supported? Um, that's a, it's a, it's, it's an extremely important uh, value, I should say, and objective in, uh, and I think it spans much more than media policy. Uh, it's uh, enshrined in the uh, in the old constitution for uh, that that was actually put up in 1814, and even though it didn't secure independence, I think it secured uh, that freedom of expression was was integrated and implemented in Norwegian law as early as that. Um, it's not. Uh, there are different systems in the Nordic countries, but it, it's very central to everything. Uh, so, so the constitution, there is also there is also a separate law for editorial freedom that says that every media should have editorial freedom. We always debate whether social media are media and so on and so <laughs> forth. Norway is a very pragmatic uh, kind of community so, uh, or, or society. So these things are solved either in the courts or by pragmatic negotiations, but, but um, uh, the, the, um, the editorial freedom, the, the, as I said, the independent press council, and uh, also the, uh, the um, governance by arms length, as it's called, which applies, of course, to broadcasting, to the public broadcaster, but also to this system of uh, press subsidies that uh, that that's 
it's enshrined in several institutional solutions. And I think that's I think that's very very central. It also makes a room for political agency in there because you always have this this um, strong uh, debate on or, or strong uh, emphasis on uh, freedom of expression and freedom of the press and so on. Mm. So. Thank you. Um, so, Maria, obviously, we don't have that that same uh, same type of infrastructure underpinning freedom of the press in Australia. Uh, and as you've said, with the pandemic, that really hastened the closures, particularly of a lot of local newsrooms in regional and remote areas. And we were already a highly concentrated media market. Um, so the government, as I understand it, is currently looking at media policy and ways to improve uh, media diversity. Um, but uh, thinking about ways to uh, support that, that brings us back, I think, to the news media bargaining code is something that the previous government tried. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the news media bargaining code and what, what that has achieved so far? Yeah, I think this was the, probably the most significant intervention um, into media policy that we've seen for some time. And I think it showed a real commitment to public interest journalism. Um, so in 2020, the Australian uh, Consumer and Competition Commission suggested this idea of a mandatory media bargaining code, which would force the big tech companies like Facebook and Google to actually compensate Australian media organisations for the content that they used on their platforms. So they were reaping all the rewards of um, this content from the advertising revenue, but not having to bear the costs of the labour of journalism. Um, so uh, it was legislated in 2021 and had its first year of um, being implemented last year. There's been, it's had some success. There's been more than 30 agreements signed between Facebook and Google and um, media organizations. Google has coughed up more. Facebook is lagging behind a bit on that. And it's estimated that these deals are worth more than $200 million a year. So, um, it has had some success. The, the ABC have reported that they've employed, um, I think, nearly 60 journalists because of this code into regional areas. Um, the Guardian has also reported that they've increased their staff. There are some flaws with it. Um, there's, there is a bit of lack of transparency and accountability there about how news organisations are using this money. Um, and it has been criticised for excluding smaller um, local and independent media organisations who don't really have the power to negotiate with these big companies. Um, and even including SBS has been left out of deals. Um, but I think it's a really positive move um, towards um, correcting that market imbalance um, and, and, and providing a long-term solution for media organisations. And other countries such as Canada and the UK and India, I think are following our lead and looking at their own codes. Mm. Um, Ellie, uh, you might have seen at the time uh, both Facebook and Google really retaliated quite strongly against uh, Australia implementing this code. At one point there was a blackout of news sites on Facebook and Google was running a lot of ads on, on YouTube kind of attacking it. Um, did you see much of that in Norway and what, if anything, did Norway make of uh, Australia's efforts on, on this front? I think we were just totally impressed <laughs> and taken <laughs> back with, oh, is this really possible? Uh, there, uh, I, I, it had been discussed in the Norwegian media and journalism spheres, both that it, the drainage of news and content and advertising uh, income to the tech giants was something that uh, also the censorship that several media actually experienced mm. uh, from Facebook and Google. So there had been a big debate about it, but I don't think anybody saw that coming, that it actually would be possible for, for, uh, for one government to 
to take action and actually go through with it. So we don't have anything that uh, resembles that. And I, I can only congratulate on that. I think it's oh. only fair. And uh, I think we all would want it. But in that matter, the Nordic countries, which have separate several majority languages and also quite a few minority languages it's we don't actually make up that interest that an interesting market for uh, so we're not not uh, not the same power mm, mm. um we'll move on to questions from the audience very shortly but i wanted to finish on uh public broadcasting because i know uh how important that is to nordic countries um, and equally in Australia, the ABC here is uh, often, uh, well, always the most trusted uh, media organisation in the country. Um, uh, public broadcasting is also supported in Nordic countries because of the interest of public interest journalism, you know, as, as part of a healthy democracy. Can you just tell us a little bit about why it's valued and, and how public interest journalism or public broadcasting, sorry, is, is supported um, in Norway and perhaps any other Nordic countries you'd like to reflect on? Uh, yeah, it, it's been around since the 1930s in Norway, a little bit earlier in the other Nordic countries. Uh, we have just changed the financing from license fees to taxes, but it's, uh, it, it's an arrangement that... Um, is protected from constant uh, bargaining. It uh, it's uh, the NRK, as it's called, the Norwegian Broadcasting Company. Very about the same name as everybody mm -hmm. else has. Um, has a broad remit, uh, and the main important things is to represent the uh, no Norwegian society and that is the society within Norwegian borders <laughs> I think uh, the NRK actually does that it, it presents diverse the increasing diversity I should say and also they also have indigenous uh, ports we don't have an indigenous channel as you have uh, but we have an indigenous um, editorial room in the Norwegian Swedish and Finnish uh, broadcasters and in Denmark, there is there are there are separate companies for um, in on Greenland, for instance. Uh, it's very much about diversity, democracy, but also very very much about language. Uh, since we since Norwegian is not the language spoken by very many people in the world, no, we couldn't expect that. We have to have production in Norwegian, and also in Sami, which is the which is actually many languages, but it's the indigenous language. So that's part of the remit that uh, that the public broadcasters should do. And of course, they should have a broad programming. As, as elsewhere, there is always a tax on this that the, the public broadcaster does too, too much. That seems to be commercial. They're online. There's, it's it's uh, it's the most uh, one of the most popular uh, also websites and streaming uh, platforms and so on. But it's, it enjoys a lot of support and also trust. And as most places, the uh, the public broadcaster also increased its trust during the pandemic. But so mm. did all the other news media. So news media really had a boom during the pandemic and it's still holding up uh, most of that, but not quite, I think. Mm. Um, Maria, coming back to you and Australia and the ABC, uh, ABC funding is obviously uh, a political football quite often in Australia. But if we look at Australia compared to the Nordic countries, we actually spend way less on public broadcasting overall. Yeah, so that's also one of the reasons that we have slid backwards in the Press Freedom Index. Reporters Without Borders have raised this as an issue that the funding for the ABC has um, been cut over the years. Uh, and also I noticed someone in the chat said um, there's also concerns about political appointments to the ABC board, so politicising the ABC board. Um, so that's why I, I really welcome the new government's um, review into how to um, 
have a funding uh, model that's sustainable and also bipartisan. Uh, they've also reinstated funding cuts from previous years, um, but I'd be quite interested um, to hear from our audience about whether they would stomach a licensed fee as they have in other countries such as Norway and the UK. That's That might be something that comes up in this review um, where anyone who owns a television has to pay an annual fee. And I'm not sure, even though Australians really do trust our ABC, uh, whether they would be willing to do that. Mm. But that might be one option um, that the government looks at. Yeah. Um, well, we might go now to questions from the audience and uh, please, if you've got a question for either Ellie or Maria, you can type it into the Q&A box uh, and we'll try and get to as many as we can. Uh, so the first one I'm going to ask is from Tito and this one will be for you, Ellie. Uh, the question is, is Norwegian press monolingual in general? And how does Norwegian media ownership laws work? So I think you made reference to that earlier. Yeah. Thank you, Tito. Um, uh, the press is not totally monolingual. We're, there, there is a small uh, newspaper that uh, publishes in, uh, in Sami, Northern Sami that is. We also have some uh, publishing in other Sami languages and Sami and Norwegian is very different. But we also have two variants of Norwegian. <laughs> Since we are so small, we need two variants <laughs> of our language. So we have <laughs> newspapers publishing in both uh, the most used and the minority version of that. Uh, when it comes to those ownership uh, concentration, anti-concentration laws, they were abolished in 2012, I think. And that kind of replaced by competition laws. So when there is a buyer, the competition authority always have to uh, have to look at it, but there's there are no, the, the laws as such has gone, have gone, sorry. Um, I think there's a couple of people in here asking about um, how much the subsidies uh, are worth to the media in Norway, um, but also about uh, how Australia's funding compares to Norway's funding for public broadcasting. And uh, I might give Ellie some time to think about if she knows the, the cost of subsidies in, in total, how much they cost. But I know uh, when it comes to public broadcasting, Australia spends about half of what Finland spends per capita on public broadcasting and about one third of what Norway spends on public broadcasting per capita. Uh, so running the old ABC pretty cheaply by comparison and SBS and NITV. Um, Ellie, do, do, uh, I'm not sure that you'll have that to hand, but do you know how much the, the, the subsidies are to the media are worth around about? Uh, if, you, if you look at the direct subsidies, uh, what we actually call the production subsidies, uh, they vary a little bit, but they are usually uh, not that much. And I, I'm trying now to to uh, calculate in Australian dollars. <laughs> As Norwegian krona, it would be plus minus three hundred million. So maybe some uh, some uh, between three and four hundred million uh, now. And I one uh, Norwegian krona, one uh, you. Australian dollar is worth six krona. So, so for those of you who are good at calculating, you can find out that it's not much money. But the total media subsidies, which go uh, is several billion. Uh, I'm not quite sure six, seven, something like that. Um, so, but if if yeah, I would have to look that up to get the correct figures. But there's no there's a big difference. Uh, and it's also a fun fact is that the direct subsidies are always much more debated, uh, the small ones, than the big, <laughs> the big cake. But that's, yeah. I guess, that comes also in every country. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, and one more follow up question specifically on the subsidies. Uh, Philip Durham has asked Ellie if the press subsidies apply for, to online newspapers um, as opposed to actual print newspapers. Uh, that's a great question, and uh, it's been uh, that's been debated for at least a decade, maybe more. Uh, originally, it was only print, 
but some years ago it was uh, it was changed so that also uh, digital newspapers can be supported and most local newspapers actually are hybrid they may may come out on a pay, on paper for one day two days a week and then they they are online have online issues uh, the rest of the week so so yes so the the, the 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 answer is yes it's open for both mm. but you still have to fill those criteria of being that there has to be news production and there are yeah yeah uh the next question i've got is probably for you maria it's from roman orzanski uh and their question is should we worry about cuts to the abc budget from conservatives and the targeting of the abc by uh, Murdoch and others. That's a bit of a hairy question there, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, we should. <laughs> I, I think that's a part. Of, that's the point of this review that the Labor government are doing at the moment is how can we actually take politics out of the funding um, and appointment of the ABC board, which I think is incredibly difficult to do. And I think. I think historically it has been conservative governments um, and the Murdoch press that have um, um, criticised the ABC or caused the funding cuts. Um, but hopefully, I'm hopeful, maybe I'm being a bit um, glass half full here, that this review might actually put in um, some protections from all sides of, of, of politics so that they have some security. Yeah. Um, and for what it's worth, Ellie, uh, I think you were saying, you know, that sometimes your public broadcasters are attacked for venturing into too much into the commercial news space. Uh, we have a lot of those same criticisms of uh, our public broadcasters, SBS and ABC and, and ITV here as, as well. Mm -hmm. um, but as you said, uh, trust for the ABC and uh, a lot of news uh, did go very well during the pandemic and it still is the most trusted. The ABC uh, also um, is our emergency broadcaster. Uh, so during a lot of natural disasters, that's where people can find their information about, you know, evacuations for bushfires or floods or whatnot. So it really does uh, play a huge role, particularly in rural and regional Australia, where sometimes there's not much access to, to news um, elsewhere. Um, the next question that I've got is around... Um, concentrated media. And so Kevin Judah White, and I might put this to, to both of you, but I'll start with you, Ellie, says, does having less concentrated media outlets necessarily mean more diverse viewpoints? If the profit motive is the government governing principle, can't it just mean more of the same? Ellie, do you want to answer that one first? Yeah. And if I answer that correctly, I will be very rich, I think, because that's one of the <laughs> that's one of the most debated uh, media political issues that we have. I think that's been on the table for as long as I've been in business and probably much longer. Uh, this um, does diverse does diversity in outlets actually create diversity in uh, in opinions? And um, I think the if I'm I'm going to be a proper Norwegian now and say we think so. Uh, at least we don't take the chance that if we reduce diversity and where or when diversity is reduced, we they think that that will uh, there will be a chance that also opinions will be lost out. But of course, also the media the media's landscape has changed fundamentally over the past 50 30 20 however you want to the, there is there are many 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 more outlets for everything so we also have the struggling with that um so the short answer is you can never be absolutely sure but securing different types of outlets and also securing professional quality journalistic outlets we hope provide, uh, produce more diversity and and we do have all kinds of of newspapers and media that are not necessarily present everywhere else so it does have some effect i think yeah. uh maria did you want to take that one on too 
Yeah, I'd like to interpret that one as cultural diversity because the Press Freedom Index also mentioned that um, a problem with Australia's media is uh, that it can be racist and sexist. Um, and so uh, I know that Norway um, is pretty um, good at subsidising Sami uh, or Indigenous media. And I've, met, I've seen people in the chat also mention SBS and um, NITV and Koori Mail. And I think that Australia could really improve the diversity of voices through a diversity of outlets in that way. Mm. And it is a really interesting observation because with digital media, obviously, uh, it's a, there's a lot lower barrier to entry for startups, essentially. Um, mm. You know, starting an online newspaper is a lot easier than starting a, a print one. Uh, but, you know, it's very hard to compete against the established media. So you might be able to introduce something new, but then, you know, uh, can it actually gain... Um, a, a big share of the voice is is another question entirely. And in Australia, I think we've had great success with a lot of new um, papers and uh, online starting up and, and things like that, but they've had a very mixed history of success. So something like Guardian Australia has gone really well, whereas Huffington Post tried something quite similar and, and didn't. Uh, and the Saturday paper, you know, started up a whole new actual printed newspaper and has done pretty well. So yeah, it's still um, still a bit of a, a mixed bag there. But that point about cultural diversity um, is really important. And Ellie, you were also talking about the importance of language, um, which again, in Australia, so many languages are spoken here. Um, so perhaps that element of supporting not just access to news, but um, access to news in your own language uh, is something that the, the government will consider as part of its um, reviews. Uh, the next question that I've got is um, perhaps one to you both as uh, uh, journalism professionals about the difference between how Norway and Australia compare in attracting young journalists into the profession via cadetships or supported training and things like that. Um, that might be a bit out of left field, but Ellie, would you like to answer that one first? How do young people, uh, how, how, how are young people supported getting into journalism in Norway? Oh, that's a that's a difficult question because I think um, uh, we all we of course have journalism training and I uh, and uh, it's also possible that still people also can uh, be employed by a local newspaper, for instance, and uh, have a kind of practical training. That's also and go on to professional training and so so. I'm not quite sure that I know all the ways, but we there are it's it's a combination of academic and practical uh, ways into the into into employment. Uh, and as far as also we have the, the, we thought so let's say also media researchers thought five years ago that oh no, the the market for or the labor market for journalists are more or less collapsing. Um, as many times before, we were wrong. It's not collapsing now. Uh, there is hiring and uh, there are new, there actually there are also new news media opening, as you said, Mo the most of the new ones that are uh, serious and successful are online. So um, uh, I don't think I, I'm, I might, I just might not know about everything. So I just say that this is what I know about it. Maybe Maria, oh. you seem to be so updated. Maybe you know more. About that. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I don't know much about or how we compare with Norway. I mean, I, I still see cadetships being advertised at the major news organisations. So I assume mm. that there's still um, a, a dedicated targeting of uh, getting young journalists in. And I know that one of the top political podcasts in Australia is actually run by two young people I think it's called the Daily Oz and they've been really successful so I would love to see more young people just starting up their own news organizations and if there was a way to support that um, that would be terrific. Mm. Uh, the next one that I've got is really just a comment uh, from someone and now that I've lost it in the chat hang on let me see if I can find it again uh, it's from 
someone who says they're the editor of a regional paper and I was going to read it out and now I can't find it. Um, uh, someone was commenting that they're an editor of a regional paper and they would like to see something similar to the Norwegian model implemented in Australia, but perhaps um, helping with the salaries for journalists, uh, I believe was the, was the comment. Um, and that might link back to what you were saying, Maria, that we do know that a lot of news media organisations who are part of the bargaining code have employed more journalists, um, but there's not necessarily a huge amount of transparency about how that's operating. So yeah, that might be something to consider. And if that person also wants to have a look at the report that we wrote, um, my co-author Christy Hess has talked about how the ABC is considering collaborating with local news on the ground. Um, uh, sort of almost like having freelance, I think, democracy reporters. So that might also be an opportunity for these local regional um, papers to collaborate with the ABC um, as a way to get funding as well. Mm. Um, I've got a couple of questions here about um, bias in the media and also kind of, I guess, disinformation and the role of politics in I guess, impacting on media and controlling media. Um, people are interested, Ellie, in how Norway tackles, um, I guess, truthful information and coverage in the media and the idea that journalism must be in the public interest. And, and how does Norway um, try and tackle disinformation, I guess, in this new age that we're living in? Again, a very big question uh, i um, how should i answer that well one one way of tackling is is securing that there is professional journalism around that's one thing we do have all not all kinds of but we of course have uh, different types of uh, of outlets also what is often called uh, alternative uh, right-wing media that where, where there have been a lot of discussion about whether they should actually qualify as newspapers, qualify for subsidies, that's also, uh, which they have not, most of them. So, uh, um, so I think the tackling is that when they apply for, when they apply for subsidies, they, they are vetted and often fall out because the, what, what is called news is, uh, is not, they don't qualify for producing uh, quality news. That's one thing. This is not without contro controversy. On the other hand, we, you have all the uh, things that comes in with social media and with Facebook and so on. And I think the, the tackling of it, it's there, of course, if, uh, like everywhere else, but the tackling of it is, is information, information, information. I think it's uh, it's how we do it. It's it, uh, the the media authority itself, the overseer, the regulator, also has targeting has been targeting a lot of issues like uh, media literacy for for children is one thing, but also for the elderly, so that uh, they should uh, learn uh, to vet and. Uh, be critical of sources so there, there are, it's it's in the schools of course so there's a lot of ways of tackling that that we have that uh, have been uh, used but not one there's not one strategy it's kind of something that goes on all the time mm. um maria uh, did you want to comment on efforts to combat disinformation in Australia? Yeah, just briefly, I mentioned, uh, I saw as well the issue of bias, I think is a real problem here in Australia that um, a lot of the public does see our media as biased. And so it sort of creates this vicious circle of why would we want to provide subsidies or public fundings to news organisations that we think are biased? I think that would be a real issue if, if we did... Um, uh, start to discuss and debate the idea of direct subsidies. Um, uh, and, and yeah, that, that went up and down during COVID as well. But I, I think generally there's a, there's a great distrust um, in the Australian public about the media organisations that we have, and that's a real problem. Mm. Maria, if I can stay with you for a second. Um, 
I'm just thinking about how Australia had fallen in the press freedom index in recent years, we have also seen because I guess in part because we don't have anything enshrined in our constitution to protect it. Uh, we've seen journalists, um, uh, officers raided, me news media organisations like the ABC and others raided by the federal police as part of investigations. Um, we don't have very strong protections for whistleblowers uh, who give information to journalists. What are some of those other things that we have to tackle to really strengthen freedom of the press and freedom of expression um, in Australia? Yeah, so those were some of the other issues that the Reporters um, Without Borders um, Press Freedom Index raised. The fact that we yeah, have poor whistleblower laws and national security laws are also um, uh, means that journalists um, can be raided and they can't protect their sources as well, as well as data privacy and security laws as well. So that legal infrastructure is is proving to be a huge challenge. There's also intimidation by um, politicians as well. Um, that was another the reason. That was another factor they cited as a, a why we've slipped down. Um, and we've seen some politicians sue journalists for defamation. So that's one way that they can do that. Um, and another problem that they raised was also these cosy relationships between media executives and um, political leaders. Um, and we've seen anyone who's been following the robo debt Royal Commission hearings would have actually seen the other day a government media advisor talking about how they leaked negative stories to friendly media. So we can see here how, and I'd be interested to hear from Ellie about whether this is an issue uh, in Norway, whether um, the media is seen as too close to politicians. Did you want to respond, Ellie? Um, yes, and it's, uh, uh, I think I have to go back to the fact that uh, we, some or many years ago, the, all the press were, uh, or the, all the newspapers were partisan, uh, which means that uh, even though the, the uh, party press has more or less uh, disappeared. Not totally. There are still our, uh, newspapers that uh, the, or, or outlets that belong to the parties. It means also that we, I, I don't think we can talk about a the how should I say a distrust of bias because it's it's more or less in the system that yeah. when you have many outlets, some of them will advocate some views and some will advocate other views. And if, for instance, we have we have a small, uh, very successful newspapers on the very, very extreme left, for instance. Uh, and of course, nobody, nobody expects anybody on the uh, on the right hand side to put much trust in at, at least in the opinion uh, articles in in that newspaper. On the other hand, it's also known for having very good journalism on, for for instance, um, environment, indi uh, indigenous issues, economy, trade unions, and so on. So, it's it's a it's a, in a way, I think the audience is also trained to know that what's out there, it, you will not agree with everything. Uh, it's another. It's another issue with the uh, with with of course with the public broadcasters, which are supposed to be at least not partisan uh, as in in that sense, and they are supposed to be if not objective, they are supposed to be critical and cover all views and so on. So uh, again, Norway is not a paradise, but I think actually that that characteristic of the system that's been there for such a long time still lives on in a way so so um so we don't actually expect people to trust the news uh we, we want them to trust the news to a certain extent but not more and the idea is to be critical but of course with the uh, with the extreme disinformation that uh, came up during COVID and so on, that that was that was more challenged. But again, we it it wasn't it didn't become such a big problem uh, as it did in other 
in other countries. I think we have yeah. to say that. Okay. Um, Ellie, can I just ask you to reflect, uh, given the kind of discussion that we've had tonight, um, what's a key action point uh, or something that the audience could kind of go home and do to either support more diverse media or public interest journalism? What's something that you'd like people to think about and do after they leave this evening? It's again a big question, but one of, one of the things that I think is makes sense and perhaps is possible is to, uh, if you if you subscribe to an online or print or, uh, or hybrid newspaper, try to keep it. That might be hard these days when uh, prices are uh, rocketing everywhere. But I think that's one of the one of the ways that you really can subsidize and and uh, and make a contribution to independent and professional journalism. And I think actually we need to have independent and professional journalism and and uh, and especially if it's an independent local newspaper. And we haven't talked much about that because there are so many of them, but but that's that's really important. And on a higher level, but that's much more difficult. I would urge you to get some real protection of freedom of expression and freedom of the press in your constitution or in your legislation. That's also really, really important. Mm. Um, and Maria, the same question for you. If people are wondering what they can go out to do and support either media diversity or public interest journalism, what would you want them to think about? Um, I agree with Ellie and would urge people to um, financially support a local, regional or independent news organisation. There's also great platforms here now like Substack where you can actually subscribe to independent journalists, not actually an organisation. But I did see that um, someone in the chat said, join Friends of the ABC. And they're <laughs> a great noisy activist group that always um, lobby hard to keep funding for the ABC. But I would also suggest that people might look out for I'm not sure if these reviews are going to have public submissions but if they do um, please have your voices heard and perhaps even uh, talk about um, enshrining uh, freedom of the press somewhere in our legislation. Mm. Well thank you everyone for a brilliant discussion uh, we will save the chat and make that available on our website along with the video from this evening's uh, discussion in case you'd like to share it with anyone else don't forget to check out the Nordic Talks podcast, as we mentioned. Uh, and thank you so much to both of our guests today, Professor Ellie Skurgaba and Dr. Maria Ray. Thank you to Nordic Talks for supporting this webinar. Our next Nordic Talks webinar will take place on 1st of March, and it will be looking at uh, Denmark being one of the cycling capitals or the one of the leading places that encourages cycling and active transport. Uh, and what Australia can learn from that in terms of public health and making us all healthier and happier. Uh, that'll be on the 1st of March. Uh, please join us for that. Uh, and thank you for joining us tonight. Don't forget to sign up at nordicpolicycentre.org.au to catch up with all our latest research, including the report that we've put out on uh, Norway's uh, media and press subsidies and what inspiration that might offer from Australia. And thank you everyone for your amazing questions tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we had nearly 900, we had more than 900 people registered this evening. So huge interest in this topic and we thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we'll say goodbye for now. Uh, and thanks for joining us all the way from Norway, Ellie, and we'll see you soon, Maria. Thanks everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.